Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. I'm happy that I'm able to share my humble views on the budget speech 2020-2021. This right to express myself and to question the policies of the government on behalf of my constituents and the population at large has been granted to me as an elected member of the opposition. I'm happy to be a member of the Labour Party, the party that has given this country its independence, free education, free health services, the welfare state, free transport to students and the elderly, and so on. Very often, I'm taken aback by the way a few members of the other side of the house throw vile remarks without realizing that we are being followed by the population and our diaspora abroad. People who till recently were swearing a blind allegiance to one party or the other are now lavishly singing the praises of their new leader. In this cold season, turncoats are highly appreciated. I will neither name them nor indulge in the type of derogatory remarks they made are the very persons for whom they have now developed new affinities. You know who they are. And I'm flabbergasted by the way they swing allegiance from one season to the other. We are often taken to task for critically examining the measures proposed or taken by the government. The budget speech has obviously a few commendable measures. I leave it to the members of the government to focus on them. Obviously, the budget speech has also many shortcomings. There is a widespread impression in the public, and rightly so, that this ruling alliance is navigating through its mandate by twisting and curbing regulations, by juggling dangerously with key institutions, and by establishing deposits as the new normal. I find it quite disheartening for members of the government to bang the table when Honorable Stephen Obigadu was referring to those houseless and desperate Mauritians who were thrown on the streets, providing them with a meal or a blanket in this cold season would not have diminished them. Has he forsaken his values, which must be enshrined in his heart, or has his new affiliation to new friends given him a new heart made of steel to the extent of becoming heartless, even though, as he rightly claims, that nobody has the monopoly of or on the heart here or outside. We, on this side of the house, we do not become less patriot than those on the other side of the house when we say it loud and forcefully that this present government has dilapidated public funds by getting into a spreading spree with a Côte d'Or stadium, which was not used optimally for the Jeux des Îles, or the safe city, or tram projects worth nearly 45 billion rupees. Si l'opposition n'applaudit pas le budget, alors on nous fait un procès d'intention. Alors on commence avec le vieux refrain, et on est les méchants. On dit que nous mettons des bâtons dans la roue. On est pessimiste, on est antipatriotique, on est alarmiste. Mais le comble est venu de notre cher honorable Subhashni Lachman Roy, qui choisit un puissant métaphore et nous déclare la guerre. Elle résume le budget comme ayant eu le mérite d'avoir mis toute l'opposition KO. Quand même, soyons pacifiques, non à la guerre on est et on reste amis. Si vous avez tellement l'envie de mettre des adversaires KO, alors mettez la dette publique KO, mettez le chômage KO, mettez l'inflation KO. Unissons nos forces pour mettre le virus Covid-19 KO. S'il vous plaît, épargnez-nous de votre soudaine envie de mettre l'opposition KO. In fact, Somebody who believes in democracy, listen to this, 
If you believe in democracy, you should not be afraid of the opposition and should not consider putting it cow. And I request all of you on the other side of the house to stop looking for subterfuges, pretexts to avoid the Tuesday sessions of the parliament or the PNQ put by the leader of the opposition. No, no, these are not the signs of a healthy democracy. This reminds me of Voltaire who says, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend you to the death. Your, your right to say it. There is one sickening rhetoric of this government. They are too good at shifting the blame on others. If anything goes wrong, who is responsible? The previous government. They forget that they are governing this country since 11th December 2014. Now when things are not going fine, who is responsible? COVID-19. Now they feel the pressure of governing the country. Our honorable friend, Mr. Etu throws this highly pertinent sentence in his speech. Who would not wish to be an opposition MP? Yesterday he said that. This present budget 2020-2021, we admit, comes at a very critical juncture. As a nation, we realize we have to make sacrifices. We admit that a special conditions need a special solutions. However, we should not be we should be careful lest that these solutions are worse than the problems. I will now analyze the measures mentioned in the budget. Just like during my maiden speech, I will stick to my principle of making constructive criticisms. And wherever possible, I will make proposals, which I sadly realize will be turned down because they will come from the opposition side. Monsieur le Président, comme beaucoup parmi vous, J'ai été à la fois offusqué, choqué par la façon dont nos frères et sœurs les plus vulnérables socio-économiquement et qui portent toujours les séquelles de l'esclavage ont été traités à la veille de la fête de mer. Mais c'est une chose récurrente avec ce gouvernement qui s'étargue d'être à l'écoute de tous ceux qui, ont, qui sont au bas de l'échelle sociale. Mais trouve tous les nerfs pour mettre à genoux Ces gens qui sont souvent marginalisés et laissés pour compte. La promesse de construire 12 000 maisons s'étalant sur une durée de trois ans. Et pour moi, encore une fois, qu'une promesse creuse et vide que ce gouvernement a l'art de renouveler avec audace et sans vergogne. Mais ce qui, ce qui est choquant, c'est que seulement, retenez-vous bien, 1800, 1800 de ces 12 000 maisons sont destinées à ces gens socio-économiquement vulnérables. Je ne saisis pas la logique aberrante de ce gouvernement. Monsieur le Président, annoncer d'un budget à l'autre la construction de milliers de maisons est devenu un mirage, voire une illusion, à vrai dire une insulte. Ne fallait-il pas construire davantage de maisons pour les personnes qui sont souvent sans emploi, sans fiche de paie, sans revenus qui travaille souvent le matin pour pouvoir man manger le soir. Je ne crois pas que ce budget va résoudre les vrais problèmes de ces gens-là. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank the Minister of Finance for some of the measures he has proposed for the agricultural sector. Indeed, food security should be held high in our agenda, and we should encourage Mauritians to produce what they consume and consume what they produce. However, I request the Minister of Finance to walk the talk and to consider the following. One, is stiffen the laws and their implementation to protect small-scale farmers, small vegetable planters, cattle breeders, fishermen from being the victims of thefts, looting and pilfering. I know that the General, who happens to be the Minister of Agroindustry, will happily amend the law. He likes very stiff laws, by the way. I am saying this because in my constituency, pregnant cows were stolen, butchered, and sold. One young planter who lives very close to me, and Mr. and Honorable Avinas Tilak must know him, one inhabitant of Goodlands, was assassinated on his plantation during the confinement. We need to protect these people. Two, 
a government finance insurance scheme to support fishermen, small-scale farmers, small vegetable planters, cattle breeders, from the numerous climatic and physical risks they take in their day-to-day -day undertaking. Three, it is most opportune to renew the young farmer's model and type of agricultural entrepreneurship. It may very well start in schools by attracting more and more youngsters to take up integrated farming and to aspire to become self-employed professionals. It will create jobs, ensure food security, and confer the dignity which is due to agriculture. Four, the Ministry of Education can kickstart a fresh program to further promote agriculture as a subject by exposing our young youngsters to modes of agriculture and animal breeding like aquaponics and aqua farming. Five, facilitate the issue of new fishermen's card. Many aspiring fishermen are wait, waiting to get that card. Six, I make a request to the Honorable Minister of Blue Economy, Marine Resources, Fisheries and Shipping to ensure that real and genuine professionals of aquaculture, like the Pearson family, be encouraged in the enterprise of aqua farming. They need to be protected because politically powerful people, now nationally known as Bavara, are making their lives difficult in Pudodo village. I will ask the Minister of Environment, number seven, solid waste management and climate change to monitor our wetlands so that they are not slowly swallowed by powerful businessmen. I raise this issue of the wetland in Grand Gob, here in this August assembly, where there is an attempt to construct villas in the place of the wetland. Mr. Speaker, sir, coming to the frontliners, I'm happy that the request which I made here for the risk allowance for frontliners has been partially granted in this budget regarding the financial exemption of 15,000 rupees given to the police officers and medical workers in the public sector. But I expected the exemption to include a wide range of friends whom I consider to be frontliners. For instance, I'm sad for the firemen, for the waste collectors, drivers, bank bakers, CEB and CWA workers, for the ones who worked hard in the supermarkets to ensure what, that we had our food supplies. What about the medical workers in the private sector? They have all worked equally hard and exposed to as much risk. Further, I see the government giving itself, itself a pat on shoulder for the 15,000 rupees given to the police officers and medical workers. Now I'm addressing myself directly to these police officers and medical workers. The 15,000 rupees is not a real gift from the government. You deserve it because you have worked for this. You are exposed to the invisible enemy while shielding the population who was confined at home. At the same time, not paying sick leaves and instead banking them represent a real problem. I have been contacted by many police officers whose sick leave banks are already full. This represents potential losses of more than 15,000 rupees for them. I urge the minister to ensure that those police officers, medical staff, whose sick leave bank is full are not penalized. I hope the same consideration will be given to the other frontliners who will be included subsequently, I hope, by the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, sir, I now make a request for the self-employed and the SMEs. I'm quite disappointed with this budget in the way, in the cavalier way in which the self-employed have been treated. I am happy that during the confinement, they receive 5,100 rupees. I even asked the Minister of Finance to facilitate the task of those who do not have a bank account and who have lost their identity cards so that they get their due. It is good that now everyone will have a bank account right from birth itself. Thank you, Mr. Honorable Minister of Finance. However, these self-employed are still suffering. The social register for the vulnerable groups has to be updated and reviewed. The change in the CSR policies has exterminated many NGOs, and the combined effect of these policies has exacerbated the problems of the vulnerable groups. Many children hit by hunger and acute poverty are no longer attending schools, 
or we'll no longer be attending schools. I am drawing the attention of everyone because these conditions may, I am saying, may lead to sexual abuse of children or they may be exploited by drug lords in their respective localities. We need to protect them. Mr. Speaker, sir, this budget does not propose concrete measures for many ailing sectors. For instance, taxi drivers, van and bus owners, who have to reduce the number of passengers in their vehicles will obviously face financial blues. Taxi and contract van owners who rely directly on tourists for their economic survival are today facing serious problems to support their families, pay their loans, and other debts. All those who work in tourist-related businesses will not be able to face the financial reality without our support. Thousands of families in my constituency who work in the tourism industry have been affected by COVID-19, like elsewhere. It makes more sense to send them to a training academy for the next 12 months, along with a decent salary, rather than giving billions to the hotel owners for them to pay back the bank they themselves own. Like this, we have shop and restaurant owners, florists, gymnasium and other retail shop owners who are in dire financial straits. All of us know that the SME community can be a game changer and they need to be supported. Has the budget really, really answered to the legitimate concerns of all the different SMEs? Do you think contracting additional loans from the DBM will solve their problems? In my constituency, there are thousands of SMEs, and most of them are not optimistic after taking stock of the budget. These people and their families are distressed, and they are even angry when they follow these debates on television, which are not really addressing their worries, their concerns, their problems. Likewise, many SMEs have incurred serious financial losses during the confinement. Some of them had to dispose of their products and raw materials which had gone waste or had expired. For example, a few florists shared with me how they had to destroy thousands of flowers. I propose that SMEs, as well as those who are self-employed, be given the necessary financial assistance by reviewing the payment mechanism of their utility bills, their loans, and their rent. Given that most businesses are stagnant and are near bankrupt situations, Extra efforts have to be done in order to provide them with a safety net so as to protect the SMEs as well as their staff. I now move on to a topic which most of you know is dear to me, my pet topic, education. Mr. Speaker, sir, now I will delve on education. To begin with, I will comment some of the measures <coughs> mentioned in the budget under the heading of education. For instance, the proposed loan to families and private secondary schools to buy laptops, printing machines, and other equipment which will help students and schools to adapt to e-learning and online education are laudable. Congratulations, Honorable Minister of Finance, for that. I expected, however, the COVID-19 pandemic would bring a new normal in the Ministry of Education, where dialogue, consultation, and meetings with stakeholders, especially trade unionists, managers of private secondary schools, and even members of university and secondary school unions. But such, such is not the case. And I deplore that, the absence of dialogue. Consultation. In my maiden speech on 3rd February, I said that this absence of dialogue does not augur well for the educational sector. Sitting down with a few advisors in the ivory tower somewhere will not give you the real pulse of the students, educators, parents, trade unionists, and other stakeholders. The stakeholders are still asking a series of questions and are baffled by a few measures taken unilaterally by the Ministry of Education. I do not understand why the Ministry of Education 
does not communicate and open up channels of dialogue. Below a few questions which haunt many stakeholders. Why the pre-primary school students are the first ones to resume school? Managing these tender age kids and enforcing the sanitary protocols on them is not going to be an easy task. Are these kids being used as cobayes? How far is it medically advisable to press upon children to, to wear face masks while keeping in mind those suffering from asthma, bronchitis, and other resp respiratory problems? There are many people who are asking whether it would have been wiser to trial resumption of the schools by starting with Form 5 and upper six students. <coughs> will sanitary kits be <coughs> made available to all schools? Who will provide these sanitary materials? I did not hear anything about any budgetary provision for this item. Given that students will not be allowed to go out during recess time, has any alternative recreational activity been envisaged by the Ministry of Education? I did not hear anything regarding same in the budget speech. Many of my friends who are trade unionists, headmasters, rectors, managers, and educators asking how to keep students confined in classrooms throughout the day. How to maintain social distancing while we know there are some classes where we have 30 or more students. Will classes be split? How to manage human resources? How will this measure impact on the timetable of educators, heads of department? How will be the new modes of formative and summative assessments? Parents are worried as to how to manage their kids who will go to school either on two or three days weekly. Will this decision go hand in hand with encouraging parents to work from home? Will the ZEP students get their meals on a five-day basis? given that they will go to school either on two or three days only. How will children struggling with their studies, whom we call slow learners, or those who have learning problems, are going to cope with a new normal? How will they manage with their studies by attending school either twice or thrice weekly? How will these students with fewer hours of face-to-face -face interaction in class or under the supervision of their subject teachers cope with their formal education? How will students of the extended stream adapt with the new normal of the educational sector? Given that the Ministry of Education has unilaterally, unilaterally decided to hold the SC and HSC exams from April to June 2021, I hope she is fully conscious of the serious impact that this is going to have on thousands of students and their families. Trade unionists have rightly highlighted that they were not consulted, but were presented with un fait accompli. Given that schools will resume in two phases, rectors and headmasters will have to prepare two different sets of timetable, one on 1st August and the second one on 12th September 2020. What will now be regarded as our third term will start on 7th January to end on 26 March 2021. Will HSC students taking the June exam in 2021 have to prepare for the June syllabus or continue working the November syllabus? The syllabus is not always the same for June and November exams. Will CIE prepare different set of papers for Mauritius or will it be the standard June papers? There are subjects which are not even offered in June but which are taken by our students who take the November exam. For example, Hinduism, Maine. Will the MES allow those Mauritian students who want to take the November 2020 exam be allowed to do so as private candidates? In fact, many students are seriously determined to clear the HSE exams this year itself in order not to miss one academic year at university level. How will the MES run these exams given that the rest of Mauritian students will be having normal classes. Where will these exams be run? What about practical exams? What about those subjects like arts and design, food studies, and travel and tourism, where coursework have to be monitored and submitted months 
before the end of the final exams. These students are worried because they do not know how to proceed. Is it normal to keep them guessing? Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm quite worried for my young friends who are in Form 4 and Lewis 6 this year. They will take the SC and HSC exams in April, June 2022. It will not be easy for educators and parents to keep these children and others focused on their studies for nearly two and a half years. Given that the HSC results will be declared in August 2021, will our students have the critical time to apply for foreign universities or will they lose one whole academic year and one year of their life if that's normal? By the way, I'm really concerned by the way some trade unionists are treated by the Ministry of Education. Trade unionists have been threatened in regards to messages sent to colleagues in a private WhatsApp group. For example, the letter dated 21st April 2020, which was sent to Mr. Surya Danan Mitua, the President of Education Officers Union, does not augur well for our democracy or good governance. Will the president of a union be sanctioned for the private messages he sent to his members? Does it mean that only those unions which endorse, unions which endorse all the views of this government will be treated with favor, while those who dare to call a spade a spade are going to be victimized or vilified? Inside and outside the parliament, you, want, you only want a bunch of docile yes-men and yes women. How could educators who do not master technological tools be forced to engage in online education? Who did not have been wiser to provide quality and reliable training to all educators, private and public, pre-primary, primary and secondary schools in order to pro prepare them to provide distance and online education, will, which will be definitely the new normal now. However, I am sadly reminded that many of our attempts to adopt digital transformation or e-projects in the public sector have mostly failed. We saw how online registration for MRA allowance for self-employed was chaotic initially. The use of tablets in schools never really took off. This budget is again proposing a national e-learning platform to connect educators with their students. How many more years we have to wait before schools are fully equipped with Wi-Fi? I am worried that very often major policy decisions are not properly implemented because they are poorly monitored. What is, that, what is the greatest irony in the educational sector is the sparse number of students taking computer science at the school and higher school certificate levels. Should not this issue be addressed by the Minister of Education? How can we meet our ambitions of becoming a high-tech country? Who will work in the new data technology park at Cote d'Or if 600 students, 6,000 students taking computer science at the school certificate, only 1,000 out of them take computer science at HSC level? At the tertiary level, the number is still more worrying. Should not the Ministry of Education be addressing this issue? The sooner the better. Or are we already contemplating recruiting foreigners to back these jobs related to the ICT sector? Mr. Speaker, sir, I move to something more technical now. I refer to page 109, 109 of the estimates 2020-2021 in the annex of the budget speech. When I read the key performance indicator, the KPI, regarding the school certificate pass rate, I know that it has to increase from 70.9% in 2020 to 73% in 2021. How will the SC pass rate be calculated? Will five credit be used to calculate the pass rate? Will you use this as a yardstick to gauge your key performance indicator? For promotion over six, you insist on five credit, and for your sake, you will use the CIE criteria, which is, mind you, one credit and five passes, including English language, or two credit and three passes, 
including English language, with an aggregate less than 45. I hope there is some rational rethinking about that. The COVID-19 pandemic should have been used as an opportunity to revisit the national education framework and review, one, the curriculum, two, the mode of teaching and learning, three, to review, produce, adapt online teaching and learning materials to meet the needs of our country. We can use this opportunity to reduce our dependency on paper materials and align ourselves on eco-friendly practices. Should not the MITD be revamped in order to provide new training programs in order to be coherent with a new normal economic life in the wake of COVID-19? We should contemplate how to move towards paperless classrooms. Now I will make a series of proposals which emanate from a continuous dialogue with stakeholders, especially a few NGOs. I request the Minister of Education to kindly consider the following. Make pre-primary education universally accessible and free, especially in pockets of poverty. The quality of the education delivered to be monitored by the parent ministry. There is a wide disparity in the way formal education is delivered in different pockets of poverty. Academic failure very often starts here. The first step of poverty alleviation should start at pre-primary schools. Two, it is important that all learners are given a free public liability insurance. This is a must now in the wake of COVID-19. Three, invest in training of in-service teachers on the positive discipline approach to help with class management. Four, include a budget to implement sexual education and violence prevention courses in pre-primary, primary, and secondary school that reaches learners, educators, teaching, and non-teaching staff, parents. Invest in a wide, in an island-wide school sensitization campaign where the school management, teachers, and students from pre-primary to secondary schools about pedophilia. We need to initiate a sensitization campaign on disabilities for the sake of staff and students, even of mainstream schools. Support non-formal schools which are operating without any grants. I request an increase to increase the grants for SEN schools. Provide more funds for the improvement and of infrastructure of schools managed by NGOs. Recruit assistant teachers for grades one and two in all schools so as to provide quality support and carry educational environment to children. Include the assessment of soft skills in the teacher's recruitment, recruitment exercise. Consider recruiting health professionals in his schools also. Create jobs for trained, qualified, and competent psychologists and counselors with a maximum ratio of one psychologist for three schools instead of one psychologist for 20 schools now. I can go on with a list of proposals, but I prefer to stop I here. And I, and I feel sorry for a few things, Mr. Speaker. Sir. This budget does not address a few things. The pensioners will have to wait till 2023 for a raise in their pension, but continue paying exorbitant prices for their medicines. Yesterday, my good friend, Honorable Ramdani, who is a medical practitioner, talked about the high costs of medicines and quality medical services. How does this budget address this issue? The public servants who will have to wait, I do not know till when, for the publication of the PRB report. Many of my friends of the public sector will retire before getting what they should have got with the publication of the PRB report. For the stranded Mauritians who were treated rather recklessly and were refused the permission to be repatriated, the horrible scenes of Mauritians in front of our embassies or on cruise ships which were literally begging to be back to their homeland. I know you are following everything from abroad and you will realize that we members of the opposition did everything we could for you. For those of us who are victims of dishonest people who hoarded the prices of different commodities, or who had to buy potatoes, onions, garlic, 
at exorbitant prices during the early days of the lockdown. I'm sorry for you. Now I move to the conclusion of my speech, Mr. Speaker, sir. I would like to conclude on a positive note. I would be more than happy if the economic problems of my country could be solved by the measures taken by the Minister of Finance. I would be happy if the homeless could be provided with a decent shelter to live. I would be happy if the different sectors could find some respite through the proposed measures enumerated in the budget speech. I would be happy if jobs could be saved and new ones created. I would be happy if my country becomes a haven, why not a heaven, of prosperity and renewed hope. I would be happy when all stranded Mauritians are happily united with their families. I would be happy if the many wounds inflicted to my country by COVID-19 could be healed. I would be happy that the prayers of a whole nation be heard and our tomorrow he smiles back at all of us. I would like to cite the following extract from Jimmy Carter's speech. In a nation that was proud of hard work, a strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in good, too many of us tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Human identity is no longer defined but by what one does, but by what one owns. But we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We have learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives which have no confidence or purpose. I know the men and women of my country will fight back the adversities and rise to the multiple ch challenges facing them. They are debrouilleurs, and even with or without the in incentives me mentioned in this budget, they will know how to run their kitchen. God bless my country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir.